All right, boom, we're in again. Um, Dylan Smith from the Vital Vader podcast, and oh, also your, um, you are Vital Vader. You're a Neovedic. How, what would you say your title is at the moment? Practitioner and holistic health educator. But you're you're working towards becoming a, a Vajra. Yeah, I guess so. Whether I do it through the traditional way or through. You know, I have to go to university to do it, the Indian university. And, and for those who don't know, Ayurveda or Vedya means uh, Ayurvedic physician or Ayurvedic doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so how long have you been, have you been practicing and studying for with that? Mm, started it around 2013. Right. And what, so what got you into it? fundamental way that I got into it was through the Vedic meditation because the same tradition that we learn Vedic, uh, the meditation, my guru is the, te- the Raju family of doctors are, are part of that tradition. So typically, you know, once you start with the meditation, you want to explore what else is there part of the Ved, which is that body, which governs the laws of nature. And, you know, you go to the Ayurveda because health is such a fundamental you know, aspect of life. So, and I went there and that's essentially how and I went to the clinic and I just saw how amazing it was, uh, all the miraculous healings that were happening and I was inspired and I, I decided to study then. Right. Right. And so were you into health and stuff like generally before that? Uh, I, I, I just started about, uh, for one year doing yoga. I learned yoga and I was really into that. Mm-hmm. Um, I learned it in India and, uh, I was doing it for like two hours every morning for about a year. If ever since I learned in India, I continued. And uh, I, I, I wanted to change what I was doing. I was studying architecture at university and I learned about the notion of Dharma, mm-hmm. that what is that most evolutionary thing you can be doing right now. As soon as I learned that, I said, okay, I, it would be, you know, violating natural law if I was to continue this. And it just didn't feel right. Yes. So I, I, I just asked my teachers, or not my te- now my teachers, but at the time I was at the clinic, and I just asked them. You know, I expressed my feelings. I felt this violation of natural law and, and this uncomfort, which a lot of people feel. You know, they feel they don't want to be doing this. What should I be doing? They want to feel aligned. Dharma, you know, Veda is one of the one of the de- desires of man is to, to live dharma. Anyway, I, I had that desire, and I, I just you know shared that with them and expressed that to them, and they just said, "Ah, oh, come study Ayurveda with us." <laughs> then study anywhere else just study here and i didn't think much about it yeah. um and i just yeah i just did did it <laughs> i just jumped mm-hmm. into it yeah yeah and so that, that you make you raise a great point that a lot of people feel that you know it's it's one of our natural most natural urges to fulfill our dharma to serve our purpose and totally. to serve the evolution of everything else um and how many people you see you would see that are stuck not doing their dharma or you know performing the dharma and does that have health consequences as well you think um can you hear me yeah yeah it's just cutting in and out a bit but yes definitely i mean a lot of people just also don't even know about that notion (laughs) that's why as soon as i learned it i i felt it but um yeah, I think it does influence, and especially when people learn about it, then they're on the path, and they it, it, it's structured. But, but really, it's it's better than not knowing about it. It's better than being ignorant about it. Because once they know, then they really shift and have evolutionary change. So yeah, I think um, yeah, I think it's it's definitely important, and and you know when you're living it, you're more healthy as well. Like even in the text, they say like for those i was i'm recently reading you know just the the science of um rejuvenation and aphrodisiac therapy in ayurveda and it just says like a man who uh, someone who is fulfilled is lives radiant health and, and has a potent reproductive health and things like that so just yeah it's a, it's a, it's one of the aspects of fulfillment doing what yeah, you're doing yeah mm. so um how let's go back to your your beginnings how did you become spiritual let's say um how did you how did you get into all of this meditation and stuff or what was your upbringing like around that my, yeah to, okay, well my upbringing and I'm really excited um, to share what I'm about to share with you because I, I recently got interviewed on the Mahasoma podcast about this and told my story how I learned to meditate when I was six years old and my and that was released you know a week ago and my mum listened to it and he goes Dylan I've got so much more to tell you and she shared a lot of cool things with me so which I'll share today which I've never shared because I didn't know about and, um, <laughs> So, I mean, let's actually, before we go back to that, let's just start with how I became 
spiritual because it wasn't when I learned to meditate when I was six years old. I learned to meditate when I was six, mm-hmm. um, or I was five or six. Um, and the reason I learned to meditate, which I just found out, was because when I was that age, I fell off a tree and hit my head for, head first on the concrete, and I broke my skull, and I was in hospital for a week. Mm. And my my parents very recent, uh, just maybe I don't, it was probably like a few months before, maybe six to twelve months before, learned to meditate, and they learned to meditate with Maharishi Tom Knowles, and he said to them, although the minimum age for a child to learn was to meditate was seven years old, he said, just teach. I will teach him. It will help his recovery. Mm-hmm. So after that, I, I learned to meditate. And at the time I said, oh, I don't want to do it. I want my brother to come with me. So he ended up coming with me. He was five years old. So <laughs> we both went and did it. And, and what my parents said was, when that happened, the, the fall, and I remember the fall very well. I remember sitting on the tree in Double Bay in Sydney and, and it's snapping. And I remember falling. And as soon as my head hit the foot, I blacked out. I can't remember. And I was in hospital for a week. I had my birthday party there. I remember it was during my birthday. <laughs> I had um, friends come from the hospital. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and what my parents said was, and what Tom also said, because they were helping him, that he was helping them throughout was because my parents did not stress at the time or panic, mm-hmm. that enabled my healing to be like it was today. Because what happened then, like I could be brain damaged. You know, most people would be brain damaged or have serious issue from that trauma, you know, traumatic brain injury. But I, I did pretty well. You know, I've seen the specialist for my skull and and things like that even recently a few years ago and just not for that specifically but he was a craniosacral mm-hmm. therapist and deals with the skull and i told him about my medical history and he goes, oh that's significant and we did the scans and things but it, it wasn't the effect that it could have been and i think and what my parents explained is the big component of that is because of the way that they dealt with it because mm-hmm. of the meditation themselves because i think when parents meditate it has a huge influence on the children and also when i learned to meditate just after, shortly after getting out of hospital for the recovery. So that's kind of how I, you know, fortunately got introduced to it with them. Mm -hmm. And, and then, you know, you use it as a kid a little bit, it's here and there, you know, it's, it's not like it's a daily practice or anything, but it's definitely contributing to cultivating spirituality. But then, you know, I, in typical, you know, teenage years of drugs and women and, you know, all those stuff. And, and I wasn't meditating. And then I, you know, continued all that and went to, um, after, you know, I think it was a, a year after, no, not even after my gap year, after high school, you know, in Australia and Sydney, we typically will work for six months and I was a tradie <laughs> yeah. like yourself. And, and then I traveled for six months and I did, you know, during that travel, I was, you know, living on cheese and crackers as my food because of, as I was on a budget and, you know, doing a lot of drugs and not sleeping properly. And then I went to India after Europe part of my travels and my first before i traveled india myself i went to panchakarma with my mum. i met my mother there so i was like into mother india's arms not just mother india my mother my logical mother and panchakarma the mother of the the raja family the, the doctors that i went to and that was really helpful because i was basically malnourished for three months in europe and <laughs> then i got nourishment there um and i learned yoga there for the first time so like most people that's how i got into it i learned yoga and um, Hatha yoga, you know, the physical component and, and pranayama as well, breathing. So I did that. And, that, and that's when I started doing yoga for two, two, two hours every day. And I was still into the other stuff. You know, as soon as I finished my panchakarma and to think about it is ridiculous. I went, <laughs> I left my mother and I went to the valley in, in Himachal Pradesh. It's called the Pravati Valley. Where it's a beautiful valley, which, but it, and it is absolutely full of ganja. And I smoked my lungs out. I remember <laughs> passing out one night on Diwali. I, I had to do pranayama because I was so overwhelmed. And that's chilliums as well. You know, they smoke these pipes, which are just <laughs> so much more smoke. Yeah. And heaps of tobacco as well. And, but I still, even throughout that, and I was still in that phase, I was doing uh, yoga every day. And, and then when I finally got back to Sydney, I said, okay, I'm ready to learn the meditation again. And I learned the Vedic meditation. And ever since then, you know, as you know, and as anyone who practices Vedic meditation, it just purifies you. It it connects you to your universality. It connects you to your true self. And that purifies the irrelevancies and the toxins out of your body. And and it starts with drugs, alcohol, toxic friendships, 
everyone knows those just start going away. And that's why I love with patients. I can just get them to meditate. And I, I, I don't tell people to stop their habits or to stop their addictions or whatever it is. I just tell them to increase the pure things and naturally the dark things will go away. Mm. So yeah, that's, and then that's how I go into it. Yeah. 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 And so, um, uh, you learned in 2013 to meditate. No, no, no. That was a, that was a, so I traveled in 2011. So I right. got back in the beginning of 2012, I learned to meditate and right. then I did a year of architecture at uni. And if I didn't have meditation, I would have not have survived because it was freaking intense. Yeah. And then after I finished the year, after the year, we went to Panchakarma, me and my girlfriend at the time, I did Panchakarma and then said, then I started, All right, I'm not going back to uni. I'm going to do Ayurveda. So that 2013, I started studying it. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that was something that you did. Uh, your father is a, a, a architecturist, right? Yes. Yeah, right. And he does a, like a Ayurvedic, not Ayurvedic, uh, Vedic architecture. Yes. It's called Vastu or Stapacha Veda. And it's mm-hmm. one of the Vedas. It's part of the Veda. The Veda is the unity of the laws of nature. And it you know has meditation, yoga, Ayurveda, and Stapacha Veda, Vedic architecture, and Jyotish Vedic astrology. So yeah, he he's doing that, and it's it's pretty awesome. <laughs> and you don't—it's hard to find these days architects who are practicing that. You know, there's now a, a bit of a which is really wonderful to see people studying it more. But that that's why he was really welcomed by the community because they had an actual architect who was practicing it. I'm just recording as well. There you go. Okay. Yeah. We continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, where do you want to go? Where do you want to, where do you want to go with this? Going to go to Raju's? Yeah. You are, if you want to talk about that, it's an interesting thing, but wherever you, wherever you think. Yes. yes I do it, want to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I, I learned with the Raju family who's a doctor's uh, an, a family of Ayurvedic doctors that have been healing for many generations. One of the few families in this world that have this unbroken lineage of knowledge and they are a very traditional family. The way they learned they start at three years old and then they have a next step at seven years old and then 11 years old. And so they've been, they are learning their whole life and they're born into it. And the way that they learn is, you know, they, they wake up in, in the Brahmin Mahurta in the time of totality, which is that time before sunrise where everything is more powerful. And one of the things that is also more powerful before sunrise is to absorb knowledge. And that's why in the Ayurveda, it teaches to study in that time of totality in that time between three 30 and five 30 AM. So they get woken up at that time and have to chant shloka. So they had a very traditional upbringing. And then, then comes along me and, and all other students and, and tries to learn from them. So like it's, um, mm-hmm. so what was really interesting was for uh, two things. I had to adapt to their traditional ways and perhaps more so they had to adapt to me because the need of the time was for me to learn Ayurveda and Ayurveda needs to be spread. And I don't have 20 years to, you know, start from seven years old and, and start this whole process. So yeah, that was one thing. And I, I share that with them. And, and then another thing was they really tested me, you know, they really tested my devotion to them and to Ayurveda and my purity and um, for the first, you know, I would spend six months a year there for the first few years. And the first one and two times I went there, you know, I would get five to 10 minutes a day with the doctor. Like, mm-hmm. firstly, that's because they're so busy and have so many patients and things, but they, they wouldn't give so much attention and soma. And, uh, but what, when I did get, and what I did get was really amazing, like far superior than, you know, spending hours at the books or hours with other people. Mm-hmm. So I stayed and, you know, there were other students there who were trying to learn and they all left, you know, in the beginning, uh, I was studying with a German girl. We were learning Hindi together. We were, had tutorials with the professor on Ayurveda together, but she couldn't stand it because the testing, it was this testing and really not just mm-hmm. giving the knowledge like that. And, and what they really, and they still do it today, the, the most important thing, and this is what I also teach my students, who are, is their priority is for me and for their students to cultivate state, higher states of consciousness and mm-hmm. to cultivate cities, which are divine capabilities and cities related to Ayurveda. So capabilities to be a healer, whether it's the pulse or the you know, uh, other cities related with the chanting and the, so that's 
their practice. When I'm in a high state of consciousness, when my health is better, they will give me more knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so yeah. it's like, you know, we can give all the intellectual knowledge, but it's about what can you do with that? And what's your capability as a healer? How can you be in the moment and inspire others and treat others? And um, yeah, how can you be in, take what's around you and, and heal them? You know, you can have all the wisdom, all the, oh, sorry, all the knowledge in the world, but how do you, you know, win that patient's heart and do your dance. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's more important than fragmented intellectual knowledge, your capability yeah, right. as, a, as a healer. So that's kind of what they cultivated. But the, but the really big thing was, was the testing and this, this social test. And, and eventually kind of they realized, well, this guy's actually, you know, <laughs> devoted because I was so thirsty for knowledge and I was really persevering. Um, you know, I remember typical rajus they'll be like come back later come back later you know uh, yeah no come back and i remember one night he goes i called him you know when i was down the street living in my house and he's um, um he's like come in come in three hours and he, and he says this i think with also knowing that three hours was like 12 p.m 12 in midnight yeah and he knows like i'm sleeping like <laughs> it's time to sleep he does it as well when i call from australia he's like you know call him I'll be available in four hours. And it's like middle of the night here. <laughs> so he goes, come in, come in four hours. And I go, okay. And I rocked up to his house at midnight. I, I set my alarm because in India, you go to bed so early. I set my alarm and went to India, went to his house, walked to his house in the middle of the night, midnight. And of course he was awake. He's awake all night on phone calls. And I rocked up. He goes, oh, he forgot about me. And he goes, can you come back tomorrow? <laughs> I walked like eight blocks because I live eight blocks away from him. And I go, and I just looked at him and he realized, okay, okay. Cause he had people over actually at that time. He had family visit at that time. <laughs> so he had to neglect his family and come out and sit with me and, and ask my, I had to ask my questions, which I had. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just a real test and, and it's great. And you know, they're just, it's, it's real, the love and, and blessings you get from a guru. Like it's a whole different type of love. It's a divine love. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge you get is, is really profound. You know, it's amazing how they can say some words such as when they first said to me, they said, come study here. And they, for them, it wasn't like a huge thing, but for mm -hmm. me, it was like, I'm changing my whole life. You know, I'm leaving mm -hmm. university. I'm going to spend half the year in India for a few <laughs> years. Like it, they have such power. And, and when, the, when you can completely surrender to a guru and that's what's, what's really important is to surrender not only to, to a guru, but also to surrender to a Vedya, to the physician. You know, we don't want to be controlling of, of our health. We want to, we actually want a physician to surrender to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, and it's just been, you know, every time, every year I go there, it, our relationship evolves because I've evolved and you know, we, what I learn is it more evolutionary and, and they give me more and they go deeper and, um, and you know, they, then I bring them to Australia and that's very fun. And I kind of have a bit more, uh, I don't want to say, but I'm hosting them, so they <laughs> can give me more knowledge. They're not busy in India, as they're so busy, so I can like sit down with them yeah. and smack me out. All right, I want to know this. <laughs> Let's get this done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's a good thing, and you know, and recently I've been doing a lot of teaching now with uh, you know online courses, and I teach diploma classes, and it just makes me really want to learn more. And I, I am very ready to spend more time and deeper time there. And I, I hope to do that this year. Mm, do you, do you practitioner as well while you're over there or not? Yeah, I, I, um, well, I, I do my online consultations when I'm in India, but mm. more, and what I really love doing there is I, um, so he has, you know, 30 or so people a day visit the clinic for consultations and, and I'll go and feel the pulses of everyone before they enter the office. And, and I'll write down what I feel. That's how I learned the pulse diagnosis. This is probably the most valuable thing I learned from them is, you know, seeing the patient before they go into the office and feeling their pulse. And then I'll write down what I feel. And then I'll go in with that patient and show Dr. Raju. And he'll say, what's, you know, he'll just clarify it because he's an absolute master in pulse diagnosis. So I can just see, and that's really good. And then I, and, and I do it actually mostly to the Indian patients because they're mostly Indian. We have the inpatients from foreign countries, but there's more mm -hmm. Indians in it. And, and they're not speaking in, they're speaking in Telugu, which is the state language. And I don't understand that, but I still can see what's, you know, still get a great feeling. I get to learn a bit of Telugu and um, it's mainly the pulse. So that's, that's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so also with the Rajus, they kind of specialize in female um, health. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. They, they specialize in gynecological health and uh, particularly fertility. And they have this special treatment called banana treatment, which is a, uh, it's a treatment that only their family does. And it's a treatment to enhance the female reproductive system and the hormones. And not just that, mainly that, but also the whole body it purifies. Mm -hmm. And it kind of started originally for fertility. um, But it expanded so much more to that. And um, not by their intentions, just by the people, the results people were getting. And I mean, they've been doing for generations, but these days, you know, you, you get women coming for this treatment because it's like a blessing. They, some people come into, cause they want a job. Like some women will come to get the treatment because they hear that their friend, as soon as they did the treatment, they got this job, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and and yeah, of yeah. course things like, you know, it's just amazing. The results we see from banana treatment is, you know, women for 10 years having excruciating pain every month on a period. Some, some women that have to go to hospital every month uh, mm. and that faint from so much pain, you know, this can be related to endometriosis or just normal dyspnea, you know, just the regular dyspnea, the painful periods. And, you know, after one banana treatment, their next period is no pain. And, um, and, uh, so many things infertility of course which is a huge epidemic and, and then there's other areas that they specialize they have special therapy for the thyroid medicine you know mm-hmm. thyroid issues and also they're specialists in herbs they're they're, they're masters at pre- creating precious precious herbal formulas and one of the things for that is a lot of the purify a lot of the knowledge of how to purify and process herbs has been lost you know you can't just take these these herbs and grind dry them and then grind them and put them together there's so much more to it of, of a process of when to harvest it, you know, according, correlated with the Vedic astrology, how to harvest it, what time, and then how to process it, how to purify it. What do you have to boil in before you grind it? You know, so many people don't know these and, and I'm trying to revive this knowledge slowly. Um, are you learning all that? Are you? Yeah, slowly. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 you know, I don't get, I don't get a lot of knowledge at once at all from them. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's, I'm trying to revive that, especially the herbs, because a lot of it's been lost and, and the herbs are a whole nother level. And it's, you know, what we call the Upasana Khan. They work with herbs. They work on subtle ther- levels and herbs are really like, they're the epitome of, you know, prana. They're this potent life force plants and minerals and substances that, you know, have the ability to be shifted and manipulated and amplified. They can be amplified and, and, and with, subtle interventions like mantra primordial sounds and, and special touch and special procedures. And, and that's what they do. And it, and it may seem like, well, how can that affect, but it's, it's one of the reasons which makes it not just having these knowledge of these amazing formulas of mixing 40 herbs, sometimes more, you know, mm-hmm. that it's so hard to make that formula. It's so hard to synergize herbs together. You can't just put herbs together because they all are good for the liver or something, but it's, it's that subtle because that is where the power is, right? If we all come from the unified field of absolute consciousness and we all manifest into our relative flesh of our human bodies or to our, you know, relative form of a plant, if we can intervene on the subtle levels, you know, between that unmanifest unified field and the, and the relative uh, manifestation of it, that's where deep change and deep healing can happen. And that's what the banana treatment is. It's a subtle therapy. And that's why these deep, found healing and experiences um, occur so that's with the herbs as well you know like something like chanting mantra is a certain way to herbs it really changes it Um, and that's all the banana medicine is it's it's very simple herbs but the main ingredient is the mantras Mm -hmm. um is there any chance you can get me the recipe for shruti (laughs) (laughs) no there's really no chance you know i (laughs) yeah it's over 108 herbs and one of them is a, a very special herb. And then of course, one of them is gold. And, you know, I recently, again, like, you know, in terms of relationships, I think it was last two years ago, two times ago when I was with them, he shared with me something about Shmiti, about the gold, which was really powerful and, and stuff like that, you know, that one of the, perhaps one of the reasons they don't share is because it, it's too much. It's too powerful for people. Like, what this what he shared like 
is about the ingredients and how they make it and specifically with the gold and, 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 you know, dealing with quantities of that. And like, it's, and you just, it, I just thought, wow, it's so cheap. How come Schmidt is so cheap when you just told me this and, and people know Schmidt is quite an expensive herb. Like it's one of the more expensive herbs. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very hard to get recipes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah no doubt <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Um, so what about, what about you specifically with vital Vader? What's, what do you do? How do, how do people get in contact and what do you, what do you do for them? Well, my, my goal when working with, I mean, right away, is kind of two things. One is it's a clinic, you know, which is in Sydney and we do treatments and consultations in person. Of course, then I'll travel or, you know, go to Melbourne and USA and Europe and all these places to do that as well. Um, and then on the online consultations as well. So those are, I mean, the essence of what I want to do is first of all, I guess what is the goal of Ayurveda is to align you with nature and align you with your human nature where perfect health lies and enliven that within you. You know, you all have the memory of perfect health. We just have to bring it back and remind your body what it is like that. And, and not focus so much on the disease about getting rid of disease. It's more just about enlivening health and then naturally the disease will go. Um, and, and, you know, do that through diet, lifestyle and herbs and body treatments if, if you're able to. And I still prescribe body treatments when I do overseas consultations because if there's a local practitioner there, I, they can do the treatment and I can send them the special oils to do it because, you know, again, use the oils that I use and the results are, are huge compared to the uh, general oils. And then the other aspect, I guess, is which, which is a huge focus at the moment is education. And that's with, you know, my podcast. I teach with a college in Australia and I teach online and blog posts, and newsletter and Instagram and stuff like that. So that's, yeah, that's the essence. And I, you know, in the future, when I can get more time, I'm going to make more online courses. I mean, I don't really any, really have any online courses except for live ones at the moment. But, um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Which has been really cool because I've been doing that as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, man, I'll just say that, um, that what you're doing with the, with the educational part, with the, the podcasting as well, you're pretty, you're, you're not shy in standing up against, you know, the mainstream medical um, nonsense that, that we've been conditioned with, you know, yes, there is a place for main, for Western medicine, but there is a lot of, you know, brainwashing and manipulation gone into that. That's keeping us in the dark about our own empowerment, our own bodies, our own intelligence, the ability for us to heal ourselves without these mono drugs that just extract one thing from here and one thing from there and say, this is your problem. You're diagnosed as this, you're this forever. And you just stand up to it and just shine the light and say, this is not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be healthy, you know, for in, late into our, into our eighties, nineties and our hundreds, we're supposed to be vibrant and healthy for our whole life. And it's just, it's really cool to see that, you know, you're not shying away from that, that, that's, you know, sh sh sharing the knowledge, sharing the information and, um, and getting it out there and changing people's minds and, and lives with it. It's really cool. Thanks bro. I mean, the other day I saw someone posted an article. It was something like anti-vaxxers believe nat natural immunity will save you from a virus. And it had natural immunity in inverted commas. And that was just <laughs> absolutely ridiculous. Or, or, or so it was something worse. It was something like anti-vaxxers believe yeah, natural immunity can protect you from viruses. Like, mm -hmm. Mimi, you like, you need, <laughs> have we become so ignorant that we've lost the fact that we have natural immunity? And yeah, yeah it's just, it's just, and sure, thank, I appreciate what you said. And, and, I, and I speak out what I can. And, mm. you know, but I, I, I have friends with other people and other doctors and who have a bigger following than me. And, and are speaking out way more radically and I, mm -hmm. and I bless them so much. Um, but, but definitely I'm doing it. And that's, that's also my nature. You know, I can't buy stand this stuff, especially with what's going on with the, the prevalence of um, the dark forces right now. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I have to speak out and, and yeah, just, I guess it's just sharing the natural side of health and, and, and making people understand that, look, you can do many things yourself with, you know, even with yeah. this COVID, like, Hey guys, there's actually a cure which is available for free and it's available immediately. 
mm-hmm. and it's called sunlight. Yeah. And so uh, I'll tell you back, it's not a cure. It's a powerful intervention. And it's just crazy that we're not he- hearing the mainstream talk about at all diet or lifestyle. Exactly. It's only a vaccine. Like, and, and it's just, we need to just balance that with, because of all the shit going on in the media, we need to just, you know, give that, that, uh, remind people that actually guys, there's so much you can do with yourself. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, it's just, and it's just, there's so many little simple things that we just get kind of used to like drinking tap water, you know, yeah. and even bathing in tap water. I just saw your recent post. I was on the phone looking at, all right, I've got to get natural spring water. It's very cheap. Um, you know, and I think it's a, it's something that I feel it's important for me right now to get my hands onto something. If, if I can't get out to a spring and get it, I can get it delivered. Um, so I, I was looking at that and then I saw your post and it's like, don't bathe in, in tap water because it's, it's got all the chemicals in it. And then when you heat it, it, it makes it worse. And so I'm, I'm going to obviously go and get a filter for the shower tomorrow or whatever. And so, mm-hmm. but it's just the things that we're so conditioned because we, we're so used to, we don't even see them as a problem, you know? And yeah. so, yeah great to have those reminders totally it's like revolutionizing health you know we it's just we've, we because we've as you said we've got conditioned to these modern industrial influences and just yeah just to to make people aware like are you serious like do you know what's in tap water you can look at it's readily available you can look at your local municipal report and you'll see all the chemicals and and the fact that most cities it's literally what's going down your toilet is coming in through your tap like that's it. What's going down your toilet? You're coming in the chat, and they've chemicalized the crap out of it, which is fair enough to kill off those pathogens. But mm-hmm. it's it's dead water, and and you definitely don't want to, as you said, be putting that on your skin when you know the heat opens your sweat pores, and then the vapor you breathe in. The the post today was about why it's more important to filter your shower than your drinking water. But definitely yeah, right. do both. And spring water is is like a next level. I mean, how can you really expect to heal any issue when you're still drinking and bathing in toxic water? And mm-hmm. and people neglect water. They think it's so simple. How, how, but actually, it's such a complex water molecule. I think there's 72 anomalies of water, which means stuff which they just cannot understand why this happens. Mm-hmm. It's it's so big and 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 it's an essential as we all know it's an essential and we use a lot of it in our, in and on our bodies and and on our bodies is also in our bodies through the sweat glands that goes in it so you know it's it's like air water air and food and and air of course is more and then the water and then the food and and we just sort of, I, I say people who you know eat organic food and do yoga and then drink tap water. It's like those girls who are in their yoga pants doing yoga and then popping pills at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah, man. Um, so uh, do you have any, do you have any other, any other little gems for us um, for like that? Oh, I just say uh, back to the, like just on the topic of essentials and really fundamentals is yeah, like get good quality water, bathing, good quality water, get sunshine, and, and another essential is the electromagnetic field we're in. So, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, in an office all the time or you're in an apartment building, like just uh, when you're in that, you get positive ions, which are the ions which cause inflammation. So you just need to balance that with negative ions. So which basically simply um, you, you obtain that from grounding. So, you know, that, especially if you're working in an office all day, get home, put your bare feet on the ground or in your lunch break, get out and sit your ass on the earth mm-hmm. barefoot and eat your lunch there in the sun for more electromagnetic field mm-hmm. uh, de-radiation. The sun will like de-radiate. We've, we've, been, we've been conditioned that the sun's bad for us, right? Like yeah. cancer. So yeah, well, that's, a, that's the whole other thing. But uh, yeah. But, but actually what helps to make vitamin D helps us. Make yeah. Yeah. Vitamins. We know that. And, but we, 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 we feared from the sun. We think it, yeah, it, it causes skin cancer, but the reality is um, the sun doesn't cause skin cancer. It, it can, but it's very rare. And right now we're seeing, you know, a huge rise in skin cancer and melanomas, but at the same time, we're seeing a huge decline in exposure to sun. You know, we, we're burying the sun from our lives. We're putting more clothes on and more sunscreen than ever. 
we've moved from 75% outdoor workers to 75% indoor working. So, and dermatologists can't put a finger on why this statistics is happening. And the answer is def clearly not because of the sun. <laughs> Ironically, it's because of it's all skin cancer and melanoma is impaired skin physiology. And how does your skin physiology become impaired? Well, one thing is not enough sun. Two is putting sunscreen on that aggravates it. Not only does the, if the chemicals are on in the sunscreen, but even if they're chemical free, when you start manipulating what, what's what spectrum of light hits your skin, then it will become unholistic spectrum of hitting the light, uh, the light hitting your skin. Then that aggravates the skin. So for example, if you put sunscreen on, it blocks UV, right? So you're getting, a, a altered spectrum of light. You're not getting the full spectrum. When you get an altered spectrum in the skin, that aggravates it and cause cancer. When you have skin, you know, sunlight through a window, again, your window blocks the UV. So you get the spectrum of light hitting your skin minus UV. What is that? That's not the holistic spectrum of light that nature provided. That That's aggravating to your skin. And then there's also the same with the eyes. You know, when you're wearing glasses, whether it's sunglasses or your specs or your contact lenses, you get the unholistic spectrum of light hitting your retina and then that will cause a hormonal imbalance because the retina is what takes in information from the light, which activates the pituitary gland, which secretes the, the hormones, you know, our hormones, most of our hormones are light mediated, which means light triggers certain hormones to be released, certain hormones to be suppressed. And if you're not getting your light, this is again, another fundamental, if you're not getting your light cycle, right? So after sunset, you're blasting the lights and you've got the screens on and your brain will think it's midday and then it gets confused. And then when it's, it's time to sleep, you're like, hold on, what time is it? I thought it was midday. And then the melatonin doesn't come, which is meant to come at darkness. And, mm-hmm. and it, or it comes, but not in optimal levels. And then, you know, melatonin is the essential hormone for antioxidant in the brain and anti-inflammatory in the brain. And uh, it, it's, I call it the king of hormones. So that's why whenever I work with people with thyroid issues or female hormone issues, you know, you have to get the melatonin right. You have to get the sleep cycles right, which means going to, after sunset, minimum light, keep it dim. Use the blue light blocking glasses if you're in the, inside with the lights. Have the shield protection on your computer screen like Iris Tech is a wonderful software. And um, yeah, keep it to a minimum. Go to bed before 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And again, when you sleep, do not have the electromagnetic fields in your room. You know, have the phone on airplane mode. Uh, don't have a Wi-Fi router on. Don't have a smart TV on. If you have a TV in your bedroom, turn it off at the PowerPoint. And and uh, there you go. Wake up before sunrise. Look outside in the morning daylight, not through a window. Uh, and then you activate that hormone in the morning. You know, there's certain hormones which only get activated in the morning, like the thyroid. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this these are the fundamentals. The, the light and day cycles, the, the light and night, night cycles, the circadian rhythms electromagnetic fields is a big one you know not having your phone or your laptop next to your body on your lap in your pocket distancing yourself from it you know i i invite everyone it seems radical and even me i only knew about this i knew about this for a while and i never took action on it but you know if you work at a desk with a laptop get a bloody ethernet cable (laughs) plug your computer in hardwire it's so easy i never did it because i thought it was hard to do you literally buy an adapter because obviously most computers don't have the ethernet. You plug the, and then you just plug the ethernet cable into the back of your Wi-Fi modem. Then you can turn the Wi-Fi off. And now I'm sitting right now at my desk talking to you plugged in and my Wi-Fi router is right next to me, me within 20 centimeters mm-hmm. and I'm, it's off. The Wi-Fi is off. I turned it off for the settings. So that's so, so helpful. So just reducing that, you know, really maintaining our natural electromagnetic field and because it really, the EMFs, or we can say non-native EMFs are very biologically active, particularly in the brain tissue, the heart tissue and the reproductive tissue. So these are some they, fundamentals. They are some very good fundamentals. And uh, if we keep going about EMFs, we're going we're gonna to head into 5G. So we'll stop there. <laughs> oh, you better not say that word. When you say that word, stuff gets censored. Seriously. Yeah, right. It, it's it's actually up. a law now. Like, well, not a law. It's not a law. Huh? Yeah, yeah, man, you will. Like literally, they they will pick that up in YouTube. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. so I would take that out or send or oh, bleep well, it. This, this is something that really pissed me off because uh because it, they they take they take away the right to have a conversation about what's healthy and what's not. You know, 
It's, it's um, absurd. I think that's one of the biggest problems right now is the censorship going on. And I just saw a video. I, I, I haven't watched it, but all I saw was from someone reputable. And it said, huge news. The Trump, associ- Trump administration has passed on something about stepping up with the censorship because it's mm-hmm. been just so big right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and so I think Trump, I, Trump's doing some good things recently. And one of, this is one of them. And uh, you can, you can, well, you know, who knows when this will come out, what, but we can what, see. What to prevent, to prevent censorship, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So just yeah. really, because it's, it's. You probably it, won't hear about that in the mainstream media though. <laughs> We'll see. I mean, yeah, no, you won't. But uh, yeah, we'll see how big news it is because it, 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 it was just posted just before this conversation. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check it out. Hey, what, is, what does your logo stand for? What is, what's in there? Oh, thanks for asking. This was um, really nice after I first started. It was my friend who's a cartoonist. So that's a Shiradara pot. Mm-hmm. On this one down here, and that's where the oil comes out. Yeah, so it's Shiradara right? pot, that's right. It's, it's, a, mm-hmm. it's a treatment. Uh, instrument where you pour medicated warm oil or you can also put uh, buttermilk in it and you flow it over the head of, of the patient and it drips not it, it flows out of the bottom so that little thing at the bottom it usually is it'll flow out so and in the, on the left is a tulsi leaf mm-hmm. um, yeah yep, a yeah. tulsi plant in the middle is aloe vera and mm-hmm. the other on the other side is neem right so, yeah, I designed it, and my friend really uh, did a good job. I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the neem, the neem tree is that a is that a what was that? Someone was telling me that you should eat it if you want to stop being horny. Is that true? <laughs> Never heard about that. <laughs> or someone um, was saying, well, yeah, it would. Libido. Yeah, I mean, uh, I wouldn't look. It's very bitter. It's one of the maha bitter herbs. So, um. Asiatica indica is the botanical name and it it, it grows in a, a lot in India. It's like a weed and, mm-hmm. it, and it has the potential to grow in Australia. We need to grow it more, um, but it's hard to find mature trees, but it is there. And uh, well, it's very bitter. So any, any very bitter thing has a kind of depleting effect on the reproductive tissue. So I wouldn't say that it stops you from being horny. Um, mm-hmm. It will just deplete your reproductive essence, which, which can yeah. make you less horny, but, more disconcerting it would be and it, and it really wouldn't do that much it's more you know if you have you know male infertility or mm-hmm. female infertility you wouldn't want to take that in excess mm-hmm. yeah it's a beautiful tree and there's many what, what would you have it for then why would you chew on it raw oh so you literally in india and they still do it today where oh, i stay for cleaning your teeth right yeah yeah, yeah they yeah, pick up they, they pick right. the twig and they chew it a bit the end of it so it becomes like a brush and then they use that because you can neem is the most common, but you can use any tree, which has got that bitter and astringent qualities. And I tried it. Oh my God. It's so bitter. It's such a strong taste. <laughs> and then they just brush it and it's great because it's a de, you know, biodegradable. It's, it's clean as well. Like, you know, like Indians, Indians are so clean. They have such good hygiene practices we can learn from. Like, mm-hmm. Like you use it the same toothbrush every day. It's collected bacteria. Like <laughs> that's something I've been crap. blown my mind for ages, man. Totally. Yeah. Even <laughs> even dentists recommend you should replace your toothbrush here and there. But mm-hmm. um, you know, we definitely don't do it enough. Mm-hmm. And how and same with the tongue scraper. Like they they'll they'll peel a little bit of the branch off, and the wood. Like you know, you can peel that little wood and and use that as a tongue scraper. Mm-hmm. Um, so then throw it away. Yeah, and just throw yeah. it back to the land, and mm. they use the banana leaves as a plate. Like, I'm not going to use plate that you ate off. Like, <laughs> who, who do I know is eating <laughs> off this plate? Like, food food carries karma; it carries people's energy, mm. and you know, I want a clean plate. And that's what I do as well. I've learned, you know, during my teachers in India, my you know my my studies in India, like to maintain that purity and you know, not just yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, name it's for many things it's good for the skin they call it the village pharmacy because it literally everything can be used you can use the leaves um which is most commonly used you can use the the, the root the twigs um yeah it's it's a bitter herb it's good for anti-parasite even just keeping a name it's an anti-pesticide as well it's a pesticide so i used to in india i I, because it's everywhere name i I take it and i put it all over my windows in between the fly screens and so it just keeps out mosquitoes and Mm. Neem oil is one well, of my favorite remedies is for lice is neem oil. So the mm. kids just give a good massage of neem oil and 
leave it in for half an hour or 45 minutes and then wash it off. Beautiful. Dill, uh, do you have a favorite spiritual wisdom or quote to wrap it up with? Uh, I mean, I've got one came to my mind, but it's, uh, uh, it's not, it may, you may, other people may have said it. And it's uh, the reason it came to mind is because it's like the epitome of the Vedas and it's yoga star Kuru Karmani, mm-hmm. which is established in being perform action. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, first establish yourself in being, you know, identify yourself with the unified field of consciousness and really experience that and then perform action. And both of them are important. So that's what I thought of. It's not, I'm sure I could find something much more. What about, what about something fascinating. specific to Ayurveda? Yeah. Let me have a think. Um, mm, oh, ah. <laughs> well, what I'll say is um, a, a shloka um, and okay, here's a good one. It's again, it's not my favorite, but it's, it's one of my, one of my favorites. Um, oh yeah. I'm going to give you a really interesting one actually. Okay. <laughs> Just cause I know yeah. your style. Yeah. Um, so it says the early morning sun rays, the smoke from the burial ground, having a relationship with an elder woman and the water, which is stagnant and taking the yogurt at night. These things will reduce longevity. So once again, what will reduce longevity? The early morning sun rays. So we'll go into analyze after the smoke from the burial ground, having a relationship with an elder woman and the water, which is stagnant and taking water at night. Mm-hmm. Now, Say yogurt at night or water? Yogurt, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the shloka continues and it gives the opposite. So then it says, to increase longevity, the evening sun, smoke from a yajna, from a homa, from a fire ceremony, Mm -hmm. having a relationship with younger lady, (laughs) (laughs) clear water which is flowing, Mm -hmm. and taking milk in night. These things will increase longevity. Right. So I, I like that. It's a nice pose. And, and, and I'll just say to the two ones, which are perhaps a little controversial, <laughs> the, the evening sun is more beneficial than the morning sun. The morning sun, especially in a place in India, it can be too much. But mm-hmm. the evening, it's said to have that evening sun close to the sun that is a very powerful way to get vitamin D and, and increase longevity. And the relationship with the elder and the younger woman, you know, it, it's just saying that when you are in a relationship with a younger woman, it increases for the man increases his longevity more, mm-hmm. you know, it makes him more youthful. Mm-hmm. So, so Hugh, not Hugh saying Hefner, that it's, you have to, it was all over it. Sorry. You have to, it was all over it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So yeah. I'm not saying that, you know, you can't have a relationship with an elder woman, but it's just one of the aspects of. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many good ones. Um, I, I could tell you another one, which I like, which I thought. Yeah. Why not throw another one in there? <laughs> it's eka buktam yogi, three buktam bogi, three buktam rogi, which means eka buktam yogi means one meal a day is for the yogis. Dwi mm-hmm. buktam bogi means two meals a day is for the bogies. The bogies are the worker men, the average men, the people, mm-hmm. men who enjoy life. And three buktam rogi means three buktam three three meals for the rogi the patients Mm -hmm. so that's saying that for the saintly people the yogis who you know are just so spiritual and doing pranayama all the time they can have one meal in fact that's going to very allow them to have their energy less rajas less tamas more purity to have the energy on the spiritual the two is for the general for people who enjoy the life for people who want health people who work Mm -hmm. three if for the patients why three for patients because when you have three meals a day there's a high chance of getting sick of becoming a patient when you're having three meals a day you're eating too much Mm -hmm. there's too much armor forming Mm -hmm. and that being said don't everyone go to two meals a day first you have to establish metabolic flexibility and be able to have three meals a day no snacks and if you want you can go but if you're having three meals a day snacks that's okay but the ideal and this is just ideal and Mm -hmm. i suggest working with someone to do this two meals a day is good Mm-hmm. so a big lunch and a small dinner yeah you, and you can choose whatever suits you i i like that 
Um, but if it's better, if you prefer to have a breakfast and a, and a lunch, then mm. that's okay. So because I'm spiritual and a tradie, I get to have three meals, right? <laughs> oh, no. Because <laughs> the tradie is still the uh, boggy. It's the two meals. You're yeah, not the I know. Patient. But, but yeah, you know, those who are doing excess exercise can, can have, you know, more. But still, I yeah. would recommend to. I don't, I don't actually. I only, only eat twice a day now. I generally yeah. don't eat, wouldn't eat breakfast. That's the best. Um, and then, yeah, have something bigger for lunch. And it's, it's tending to become smaller for dinner now. It's, it's yeah, yeah. Well, it didn't used to be, but it's it's coming that way. I feel better. And mm-hmm. yeah, doing more exercise too recently, which has been super beneficial running on the sand and, and, and really increasing cardio because I thought I was fit, but I was just, I was just healthy, but not, um, not active enough, you know, mm. and that's, that's been really clear lately. Even my meditations have gotten way better because there's so much more contrast between the activity that I do when I'm exercising hard and then that deep rest of the bliss of being in meditation and just feeling it come back into one, you know, it's just so beautiful. And so, yeah, that and all the, all the goodies you sent me two weeks ago and it's been, everything's been mm. in positive direction. So that's good. Yeah. I, I, I find sometimes when people get on the spiritual path, they can f- kind of neglect the exercise a bit, the body movement. They just get too much in their mind and consciousness. Yeah. So, yeah. It's important to attend to that. Yeah. Anyway, Dil, it's been great to chat and you are a fucking absolute torrent of knowledge and wisdom. And I could just sit here and just keep asking you questions and, and getting discourse all day, but I'll let you go. Um, thank you for sharing uh, what you have about your story today. And thank you for all of the goodies that you do on your podcast. Um, obviously, people can check it out. Vital Vader is there a .com for the, web, the website? .com.au beautiful.com.au and you do also do a whole heap of you know free um educational stuff about um self-massage heaps just heaps of stuff that people can go there and immediately learn about ayurveda and their own health and um find out when the rajus come to town to come and get a diagnosis and do banana treatment all of the goodness man you give so much and um it's it's absolute privilege to uh get to share what you do with everyone that's listening to this so thank you very much Thank you so much. Boom.